If you come from an hour of MATLAB background, you might be used to the idea of rectorization. Suppose I have a list of numbers and I want to add them up. So in R, it looks like this. 1, 10, 10 million, right? And I would sum them up just by doing sum x and it give me a result. To disable scientific notation, we could just use format and we say it's format sum of x and we turn scientific notation to be false. You realize that this is done very, very fast. The same idea, if I try to take x and I say x, let's say 1 to 100, and I said x to the power of x itself. So x to the power of x. So the first one is x to the power 1 to the power of 1, that's 1. 2 to the power of 2, it's 4. 3 to the power of 3, that's 27. And then 256, that's 4 to the power of 4, so and so forth. And on the last element, it goes 100 to the power of 100. And I'm demonstrating this idea called the vectorization. When you get into data science and Python, some of these ideas don't immediately translate because Python itself is not a vectorized language the way that R or MATLAB is. In fact, being a vectorized language, many of the metrics operations in R and MATLAB are actually implemented in C or Fortran, which is why summing 1 to 10 million takes a fraction of a second in R, but it might take a few seconds in Python. And one telltale sign of a beginner data scientist in Python is that they will write a for loop to do something that can be done in a vectorized way. So going back to the earlier example, instead of doing it the way I show you, you would have a for loop and say for one in range and then the length of x and then you do that and then you iteratively go, go through the different numbers incrementing it. And the reason for that is because every computer science major would have learned for loops in their first programming class, maybe in a CS 101, for example, right? And then they come across NumPy and they learn how to program functionally in Python using a very functional style without truly understanding the amount of power that NumPy gives them. Instead, preferring to stick with the for loop because it's what they know, because it's ubiquitous in programming and because it's more natural if you come from a CS background versus a math background. So this year in 2023, I'd like to challenge you to think about how you can stop using for loops to solve problems that can be solved in a vectorized way. And I'll have you by giving you some examples and also demonstrate why your code could be running hundreds to thousands of times slower than it really needs to be. Okay, in order to time our code, let's create a utility decorator for ourselves. So let's go ahead, import time, and I'm just gonna paste in a simple utility function that I have all the time. So it's a timeit function, basically says, grab this, this is a decorator. I, if I just add timeit onto any function, it will provide the time, the start time, it will then execute the function, and then it will print the end time, right? So it starts time, executes the function, prints the end time, and then it takes end minus start, and it print that out in seconds. Let me save all of that, open up the terminal, and we could do a simple test. Right, so we could go ahead and say add a time it. Let's do a simple test. Let's just say test. It doesn't really matter what it does, so I'm just gonna say time dot sleep. Sleep for one second. Then I'm gonna say if name, meaning if this file is run directly and not being imported. So go ahead and just execute test. Now I could go to terminal and make sure all of this works. So I'm gonna say no loops. Dot py. Couldn't find it because I'm in my desktop here. So I will need to change the directory to my desktop, clear the screen again, and try. Forgot to wrap it properly, so let's do that. And now it sleeps for one second, and it gives me the running time, right? So in total, the one, this one second come from the function itself, the time of sleep itself, and then there is some extra overhead for trying to process this and execute this. All right, so it looks like our decorator is working. So let's go ahead and replicate the same exercise that we did at the beginning of the video with R. So we want to sum a number from, let's say, 1 to 10 million, all right? How do we do that? I want to add iteratively, just to show you how to, how most people would do it, and then how to show you how a real professional would do it, all right? So um, it's going to take a number. So this number will be, we know it's going to be 10 million. So I'm going to just put N right now. And let's go ahead and define that number. So I'm going to say N equals to 10 million, so 10. In fact, if we want to, we could bring this all the way back. Uh, I'll trade it up as a con trade it like a constant, just trade it all the way up there. And then we were just gonna call add iteratively and we pass an n. We saw how we did it in R, right? We say take that and sum it. But that's the vectorized approach. How would you do it iteratively? So we wanna have an accumulator. So this is an accum, you could say accumulator. Uh, I'm gonna call it sum, just to keep it simple. A lot of CS 101 classes will teach you how to do this. This is quite basic for a programming class. But I will say something like for i in range and I could go all the way up to n plus 1 because you want to include n, right? And then I would say sum would just plus equals to that number, which is i. And then finally, if I want to, I could just bring sum. If I want to test that this works, I want to put n to be a small number just to make sure everything works, right? So if I run that, it would say 6. Okay, how do you get 6? Well, that's 1 plus 2, that's 3 plus 3, that's 6, right? So you know it works. But it's not printing out the time because we haven't added decorator, so let's go ahead. Move this down, save it, run it again, 
And now I give you a running time and it gives you 1.6689 and I multiply by 10 to the power of negative 0.5, all right? So we are gonna keep this and see how do we rewrite this by using a vectorized approach. So I will need to bring in NumPy. So import NumPy as NP. I will not need the n equals three anymore. So just remove that. And then we could say def define and add what? At using a vectorized approach. And we do the same thing. We say take n and then what do we want to do? We just say add numbers to n. So we want to say add numbers up to n. You could do it like a doc string, right? Uh, if you want to add doctrine, you should add it for every function, but let's keep it this way, keep the video short. We could just go ahead and do a sum equals to, we could say numpy sum, and then numpy sum, we just do a vectorized sum. What do you want to sum? That's the array that you want to pass in. And we can create that by using a, a range and n plus one. And you can print sum. So these are the two different approaches. One is using a for loop, one is using a vectorized approach. And notice that I did not return anything and the return is actually from here, return n to start. Which means I could remove this, I could create a variable to store that value, I could say a0, and a0 is gonna come from the return, but th since there is no return, it's gonna take this return, n minus the, uh, the n minus dot. So that's a0, that's kind of like the null hypothesis. And then we're gonna have a1, and a1 is gonna be add vectorized. And same thing here, we're gonna say, uh, and so you have a0, you have a1, you could just minus them, and or you could just say, right, so how many times is a0 faster than a1, for example, or how many times is a1 faster than a0, right? Uh, we know that, because I'm doing this video, I know that vectorized is going to be faster, so if you use the f string, you say this is a magnitude of, then we just compute this value, we say a0 over a1, okay? We save all of that, we run the Python node for loops, um, and the reason why it's a none type is because there is nothing being returned, so it's a none. So how do you get it something to return? You need to add a timer. So time it, time it, let's do it again, run it. So you see that the first time it runs, this is the iterative approach using a for loop approach. It gave you the same number. This is the same number that we got in R, by the way. When we use R to do it at the beginning of this video, we see the same number. And it takes 0 0.33 seconds. And the second approach takes 0 0.01 seconds. And it arrived at the same number. Realize that the numbers are the same. 5000, 500, and I don't know how many zeros are there, but then the magnitude of 22 times of difference. So the second approach is so much faster. And you don't have to just use it with a sum problem or add problem, addition problem. You can do a vector and try to do, we, we're gonna try a, a different approach. We're gonna try a matmul approach, a matrix multiplication approach. But before that, I wanna show you what about a vector uh, element-wise multiplication, for example. So I'm gonna show you this and I'm gonna say, so don't want to forget the time yet, so let's might as well just add that right there. And I want to use the, I'm going to call it add more iteratively. And it's going to take V, it's going to take W, and it's going to take a bias, all right? So V being a vector, W being a weight, and B being a vector. So this is something like if you learn um, neural networks or deep learning, if you're trying to learn neural networks, you come across this kind of vectorized approach. So I'm going to go ahead and just uh, initialize something. I'm going to say initialize zeros and that is just the, like, the, the length of we. So this is, a, this is gonna create something like this. It's gonna create a vector that looks something like zero, 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 zero. And if the v is a vector of four element, then you would have a four, four. If it's a vector of five element, then we have five. And then now let's do our for loop, right? So for i in range v, uh, actually we need to do something like length v. We could also actually try to do something for i in v, I guess, right? And then what you want to do is you want to update each one of them. So you want to update them, so you say, out, take the first element, so in this, in the first run, it was going to be this, so this is zero. So the first one, i is going to be zero, so it's going to uh, relate to this. And that is just going to be, take the v of i, multiply by the w of i, because the w is going to assume to have the same length, because you're doing it element-wise, right? So five, uh, a vector of five, multiply by a vector of five and then at b. And b is just gonna be a constant term, so we don't really need to do uh, anything fancy here, we just have to add b, b being a, a simple scalar. And how would we do this in the vectorized approach? So let's go ahead and say time it, define. Now let's do a vectorized approach. We say mal, I could say element mal just to be clear, like element-wise mal, I guess I can, but let's just stick to this. Just keep it quick, vectorize. And we're also gonna take vwb, and what are we gonna do? We're gonna say V multiply by W, multiply by B. I 
could do a return right away, but I probably don't even want to return because um, I don't want to have any of this return because I don't want to take this return n minus dot because I'm going to use it to sort of see the difference between the time. And so I now have the two approach. One is using a for loop, one is using a vectorized approach, and I can now time them again. So let's initialize some numbers. I'm going to say v is, uh, let's create some random numbers just to save some time. Random of m, and I'm going to put n here. In fact, I'll do the same for v, for w, I'm going to change that to w, and b is just give it a simple bias term, I'm going to pre, okay? Just like what we did up there with the a0 and a1, we're going to try b0, b1. So b0, that's going to be this. And then we are going to have a v, w, and b. We are going to do the same thing here for b1. And we're going to switch that to mole vectorize, which is what we name it up here. We are going to just copy this, bring it down. Then we're going to say b0 divided by b1, difference. Save it, run it. So the first trial, we get a 23 times difference using so much better if we use the vectorized approach. Now let's try this. Um, the first one, it gets you 3.17 and the next one 0 0.02. If you are not sure if the answers are correct, you could actually just print that out. So you could add a print out. But you want to be careful when you do this print because you know the numbers are huge. The numbers are somewhere like 10 million. If you want to just temporarily move this down, at a number of n, you could run that, and you see that the this is not even a multiplication. This is an addition. Let's run that, and you should see the numbers are the same. If you take away the b, just print that. You should still see that it is still faster, but the difference is a little bit smaller. But as you approach something more reasonable, when you're doing deep learning, you're not gonna try n equal to ten. You're gonna try something larger then you see that at least you know that the code works, whether you write it iteratively or whether it's a vectorized approach. So I'm going to switch it back to 10 million. Remove that, uncomment this, save it, run it again. So again, the first test, 22 times difference. The second one's 115 times difference. This is taking only 0 0.01 second if you use the vectorized approach versus without using it, you're going to run 1.8 seconds. So in total, that's 115 times of difference. So realize that this is just an element-wise multiplication and then an addition to a scalar. But what if you actually want to do a matrix multiplication? Sometimes you hear it being referred to as a, as a mat mool. So mat mool, kind of a matrix multiplication. What if you want to do that? Let's try and do a, the normal for loop approach and then we do a vectorized approach. Do a time it, just to time the function. So let's do a dot product by hand. We're going to just use a for loop approach. So I'm going to say dot iteratively and I'm going to take an X and I'm going to take an M. Okay, so think of it like a hidden layer in your neural network. If you do any kind of deep learning, this should not, this should be quite familiar, right? So I want to add a doc, doc string here. I want to say this is a matrix multiplication of X and M. So M would be something like, I don't know, let's give it like MP array. And x would be something like a random number, but you want it to at least confirm in terms of dimension so that they can do this mat move. So I'm going to say random. If this is a 1 times 5, then I want this to be something like 7 times 5 or 5 times 7 or whatever, because you can always use the transpose, right? So this could be something like, let's say 7 times 5, because this would be 5. So this is 1 times 5, 7 times 5. You can at least do an x times m. Uh, m. So remember how we initialize the out? like this, out equals to mp0, I'm going to do the same thing. So out equals to mp zeros, and I want to initialize that to the shape. So in this case, this is the x, right? This is a 7, so I want to say x dot shape. I could take the first dimension, which is going to give me 7. Then again, I want to have the accumulator, just like what I've been showing you, um, sum equals to 0, and then I just iterate, uh, iterate over that. And I want to use the for loop again, so for i in range, x shape zero, no surprise there, total equals zero, and here we just add to it, so first at ij, so there is a nested for loop, but this is still not doing the multiplication, we still want to multiply that by the m, so m is this, right, zero, j. Now we want to do assignment to reassign that back to the initialized 000 because otherwise it's not meaningful. So we want to save that, 
assign that to total. That's our for loop approach. Looking at our vectorized approach, it should be a lot easier. It's just a dot product. So we can say define dot vectorize, and I'm going to say x and m. Then I'm just going to go ahead and say x dot dot. Now, if I show you x, x is this, 7, 5. m is a 1 times 5. So I can't really do a 7 times 5. I can't really do a, I'm going to take 7 times 5, multiply by a 5 times 1. This I can do. This is allowed. The inner dimensions confirm to each other. But right now it's a 1 times 5. So I only need to transpose that. So I'm going to say m dot transpose, just like this. By the way, this is the same as if you were to take np dot dot. This is the same as if you take np dot dot and you say x and then m dot t. This is also okay. Both are, both are uh, perfectly acceptable. And now let's go ahead and try that. Let's test that. So um, I have this. I'm just going to copy that, paste it right down here. So I'm going to give it more sensible results. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is fine. But here, I don't want it to be 7. I want to use n as well because we've been using n. And here, I don't want to hard code the value 5. I actually want to use the dimensions of this. Instead of hard coding 5 like that, I want to say m dot shape. And that would just be 1 because the outer one is just purple color bracket. And then the blue one is the 5, right? So I want to take that second one. And now we could do the same test. So we're going to try and say, okay, what if I take a dot iterative approach? What would that be? And then I want to say C1. This time, I'm going to take dot and I'm going to say vectorize approach. What would that be? Then I want to compare two of them. So change this to C0, change this to C1, save all of that. Great. Now let's go into terminal, let's run that, and let's see. So the first test, A0 against A1, it is still going to be 22 times faster. And then the next one is 117 times faster. We both, we, we know this. And now we're waiting for C0 against C1. And that's a magnitude of 460 times faster. So the first approach is going to give you 21.42 seconds. The second is 0 0.04. So again, if you want to test them, then you can change this number back to a little bit smaller. So just to make sure that you wrote all the logic correctly, right? So n equals to 10 instead of a million. And we are going to just comment out all of this because we're only going to only interested in this one. And we are going to change the, we're going to add some print statements up there to sort of see the results. Instead of x dot dot, it's a print. And here we're going to print it out as well. So if we do all of this correctly, if we wrote the logic correctly, they should be the same. Let's run that. Okay, so this is a 4.7 to negative 3.49, and you get exactly the same result. So you know that the iterative approach, you're not making any, you're not trying to take any corners, you're not, uh, writing any kind of uh, erroneous logic, they are exactly the same. You get the same result whether you use it uh, using the for loop approach or using a vectorized approach. So it's a fair enough test, and you see that it's still a magnitude of 462 times faster. So bottom line, if you're the kind of person who default to using a for loop to solve a problem, I hope the short examples in this video will maybe add some perspective to you, and maybe you start to think about how you can use NumPy uh, to more effectively solve problems, starting from vectorization. Not only is it more efficient, it's also more optimized because it's written in C and Fortran, and on top of that, vectorized code is typically more concise, more compact, and more readable. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you in the next one. Happy New Year. Make 2023 count.